So when we thought about iHub Speaks, we really wanted people that were really in these really interesting spaces from interesting backgrounds doing interesting things. Um, the first talk that we had was two months ago, and that was with Blaze. And he talked about music and how music is really changing the landscape, especially as it intersects with tech. I spoke last month on how to handle scandals um, and, and used a couple of uh, uh, scandals that happened in, in Kenya. And today we're going to hear from Jim Chuchu, who I am now a fan of. <laughs> so Jim Chuchu is, is a renowned filmmaker who is doing really incredible work with beautiful cinematography um, and using really interesting topics to really tell a story. Um, so th the first uh, film was about our lives. Jim, is that correct? Our lives? Yeah, stories of our lives. And now he's working on the series, the second series, or a series called uh, Hunt Toko. I'm not from Kenya. And so you have to excuse my accent a little bit. Tuko Macho. And so it just came out last Thursday, and already it has close to 50,000 views. And that's really significant, especially if you're talking about a web series um, that, that has just been started. Um, Jim is also part of the LBGT community. And as you know, that's part of the conversation that a lot of Kenyans, and even throughout Africa and many parts of the world, just aren't hap is, is not happening. So we have these really interesting spaces between art, culture, lifestyle, choices, freedom. And what Jimmy, Jim Chuchu represents is a culmination of all of them. So I am incredibly thrilled to introduce you to Jim Chuchu. Jim? Uh, hello. Um, wow. Um, I had like a presentation lined up for for this group, but then I can see like it's a different group than I had imagined coming to the iHub. So I'm just out of curiosity. I want to know how many tech people are in the room. All right, and then how many non-tech? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, um, so, forget that. Um, the title of this presentation was Stories for a Fractured City, which is a big mouthful. It sounds epic, and I worried about it because I don't have any special effects today. Um, I'll just be talking. Um, so I'm going to talk about storytelling, because storytelling is the thing that I have been doing ever since... I was in a band, I, I was a photographer, I was a designer, I've done all these things, and I think storytelling is the thing that has been constant in all those fields. Um, my relationship with storytelling has changed over the years. When I started, um, I did stories because I wanted to be a filmmaker, I wanted to, to make films. And so photography was one way to head towards filmmaking. Uh, I ended up in music kind of by accident, and I found that there was storytelling in there. But that's something that I learned over the years of, of doing music. Um, I call these stories for a fractured city because on some level, this city is very fractured. Um, like everything looks OK, and there's traffic moving, and people are eating and going to sleep and waking up. But um, if you look beneath the, the surface of all this calm and peace, it seems that like there's undercurrents of some very some much darker things, and and you see this on WhatsApp, you see this on Facebook, you see this in conversations you have in secret with friends or whatever in a bar or whatever. Um, and for me, fractures are these things where we say things about one another, or we believe things about one another that we wouldn't want to say to one another in public, uh, things that we can only say to a close friend, things that we can only say to a person we're in a relationship with, 
but if we were to meet the people we are talking about, we wouldn't be able to say those things. Um, and most of these things are stories. Um, the other day, I found myself in a terrible conversation where uh, people were comparing the fighting skills of different tribes in Kenya. Uh, so someone was saying, uh, Kalenjins are not to be messed with because like, they have spears and, like, and arrows and shit, and, and they don't fuck around. Like, <laughs> when they get angry, they get really angry and they kill people. And then someone else says, oh no, I mean, like the, the Luos, uh, they're very good with stones. Like it was a terrible conversation, but the people having that conversation were not, were completely unaware of what they were saying to one another, about one another. Um, I don't know at what point um, we take red flags seriously. I don't know at what point the country says, yo, we need to chill. We need to stop it with this uh, stuff. We've been here before, but now we are here again. And on some level, it sounds like it's worse. Because now, what are we afraid of? Like, last time it happened, and everyone's free, right? Uh, last time it happened, people were displaced, and what else? Like, some of them are still in camps. Um, so there's a, I get a sense that that now we are not afraid, like now we are experts at fighting, and now there's no ICC to worry about, so whatevs. Um, and so where does storytelling come into this, and where does, uh, for the people in this room, where do we fit into this? Because either we are, you might not think of yourself as a storyteller, but some of the shit we say to one another, those are stories. Um, the idea that, um, one tribe has a way of doing things around violence. The idea that um, one tribe has got a thing that another tribe doesn't have, um, a lot of those elements are stories. I remember in 2007, eight, there was a story about uh, uh, Kikuyus were able to get money from equity ATMs, like all they had to do was kind of tap a secret code and <laughs> they'd get whatever amount <laughs> they wanted. Um, and now you're laughing, but that, was, that shit was serious in 2007. Um, and it allowed people to, to say, you guys have access to money that we don't. Um, the nasty stories we hear about uh, circumcision and what it means to your masculinity, whether you're a man or not, uh, that stuff, we laugh about it, but then people are able to take a knife and stab someone because you know, you're different. So, I've always felt like the role of storytelling is to, is to get in between these uh, shadows and these nasty spaces and maybe bring light to some of these spaces. Um, and so I feel like one of the things that storytelling does is to bring light to places that don't have, have not seen light for a long time. Uh, one of the places that hasn't seen light in a long time in our country is our history. Our history is, uh, is revised and cleaned and kind of covered up. Um, and as you leave high school after studying the Mau Mau and all that stuff, you come out and you read adult books about colonialism and find out that what we learned in school was really cleaned up. Um, we learn that how we got our independence is a myth, but there are some elements there that were storytelling. We learn that even the guys who designed our national anthem were not necessarily the guys who designed the national anthem, and that maybe it wasn't really a Pokomo anthem, uh, and that maybe the guys who are credited for it aren't really the guys who did it, uh, and that maybe we didn't get independence, maybe we were given independence. Um, there's all these layers of like what is real and what is not real. Um, for some strange reason, Kenya has never really explored its history. Uh, you don't see films about pre-colonial Kenya. Um, you don't see... And if you go to a country like America, I mean, what part of America's history isn't on film, isn't in comics, isn't in books, isn't... Like, they explore their history over and over again, they remix it, they retell it, they... And and it's not just about budgets, because <laughs> the last time I talked to someone about this, they said, yeah, but 
doing a period piece is really expensive because then you have to dress everyone in like clothes from the 80s or 70s. But I don't think so. I think, um, I think countries must exercise, must look at their history over and over again and, and find relevance in it and find lessons in it uh, because then we keep repeating ourselves because we don't know our history. Um, I feel like even the, the idea of countries is storytelling. I feel like the American dream is a story. Uh, Obama was a story, the idea of change. Um, being patriotic is a story. Uh, if you look at, again, Americans, uh, I think growing up in America must be very interesting because you grow up in a country where you're repeatedly told this is the greatest nation in the world. We are the greatest country on earth. Um, there's no Kenyan child who's ever told that you're growing up in the greatest country in the world. It's, it's <laughs> it would never happen. And I wonder what happens growing up as a, by the time you're 20 years old and you've just been hearing, I live in the greatest country in the world. This passport is the greatest passport in the world. I can go anywhere in this world and doors will open for me because of my citizenship. I wonder what that does to a person. Um, rather than growing up in Kenya or Uganda or wherever and to be told um, from the moment you're born you owe the world <laughs> 75,000 shillings. So you grow, you're a debtor from the minute you're born. So you're not growing up in the greatest country in the world. You owe people money. Uh, and I wonder what that does to us. Um, I heard the other day that the Navy and the Army and the, and the American, all these branches of the Army in, in, in America, they are very invested in creating movies around, like that make soldiers look cool, that make war look like, because then when you make a film like uh, Black Hawk Down or whatever, all these films, uh, then you get a spike in recruitment because then young men are sitting in their homes watching these films and if you're a young man who doesn't necessarily have a big dream and you have these images, images, images of strong people triumphing, 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 blowing shit up, uh, getting away with shit, um, I think I can imagine if, if we were to make films where the Kenya army looks cool, you know, with like Transformers and like Humvees and all this stuff, I feel like recruitment would prob probably go up because then what do we think about cops in this country? What do we think about KDF? We think of them as those guys who looted Westgate. We think of them as the guys who harass young people. We think of them as these guys who take bribes everywhere. The most corrupt uh, institution in Kenya, that's not an institution you want to sign up for. It's a place you go to when there's nothing else. So, storytelling can build countries, I feel. Stories can build an army. Stories can take people to war. Um, if we decide today that Somalia are the bad guys and we tell that story to ourselves over and over again, then we'll go to war and we'll bomb them and we'll find it okay to take their kids and their women and shoot them because they are not human. They are the enemy. So. For me, that's why I approach storytelling as being something very powerful, very potent, something that even governments could invest in to change the way their citizens think about themselves and about the world. Um, stories can kill. Um, stories killed in 2007. And I, I get this feeling that stories might kill again in 2017 because we haven't learned our lesson. Uh, stories are, are our memory. The other day I had Moi, Moi, the second president, was being asked what was his secret to long life, and he said uh, something about belief in God. And, and, and everyone was like, <laughs> because what we know about Moi wasn't exactly you know, a lot of dark stuff happened under Moi. Um, but because we don't have uh, a memory that tells the truth about what happened during Moi's years, we're not able to say, no, Moi, you can't say that. Because there's this film here, 
that shows you that shows us exactly what you are doing while you're in presidency. There's this book that lists the number of victims that, you know, suffered under your madness. We're not able to challenge people when they say, I'm a good guy. Um, because we don't have stories that record these memories. Um, Kamlesh Patni is able to transform into Brother Paul and start a church and collect sadaka from people, even though he owes the country so much, billions. But because we don't have that story anywhere, like right now, if you were to tell a kid that this Brother Paul is, is actually a criminal, where would you start? Where do you go to for the memory? Uh, we don't have that. So people are able to to remix themselves, to come back as heroes, to come back as as good people after having done some crazy stuff. So for me, that's what storytelling is. It's not just entertainment. Um, however, we live in a country where storytelling is also dangerous. Uh, sometimes there are some stories that should not be told or cannot be told. And for a long time, I used to watch Kenyan TV and, and wonder why, why so many soaps, why so many comedies, why was everyone kind of doing this light, 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 light things, even when we live in a city that's not always light. Uh, where were the stories of people who are angry? Where are the stories of people who are afraid? Because this city has, doesn't have a shortage of people who are afraid or who are angry. Uh, but we don't see their stories. If you watch TV right now, you'll see a comedy about uh, house girls. You'll see comedies about uh, young, upwardly mobile, middle-class women just trying to find love in this city. And those stories exist, yes. There are young, upwardly mobile, uh, middle-class women in every city looking for love. Uh, and Yeah, but, but we also have to l find the other stories that are hiding, that that the stories that never get on TV because they're too political or they're too bloody or they're too angry or they're too dark or they're too young or too old. And I think it's important for us to tell all the stories. I used to have a lot of uh, kind of contempt for these kind of light, light stories until we tried to make one ourselves. And my family members here, the Nest Collective, are here, most of them. And we had a little adventure in 2014 where we tried to tell one type of story <laughs> that was one of those stories that you don't tell. Uh, and we learned that there's a reason why people don't tell some stories. Um, uh, 2014 was an interesting year for me because I learned that I actually work in a field where the state has a vested interest in the product of your day job, which is odd. Like when you're writing a book, you don't worry about passing your book through a state agency to be, to be looked at. When you're making music, when Saudi Soul are writing their lyrics, they don't care. They don't worry that some, some guy you've never met who's being paid a state salary will come and check your lyrics and say, yo, you can't use this word. Um, so it's very interesting that film is one of those places in this, in this city. Film is one of those mediums that actually has a has an act in the government that is dedicated to its control. Um, and I think whoever designed the stage, the film and stage plays act was a very clever person because he understood the power of storytelling. He knew that if you let Kenyans walk around telling whatever stories they want, that there could be a problem because then people would start to ask questions and people want to, you know, to point at these stories and say, what are you doing about this? So. There is no music act. There, there is a publications act, but no one, there is no body that uh, follows it up. Um, we've been fighting a lot with Ezekiel Mutua, as the Kenyans on Twitter, as Kenyans generally, people have been fighting with this guy a lot. Um, because the idea that uh, a group of strangers, you'll probably never meet them, that they get to decide what Kenyan adults watch. Uh, and that if they don't like a thing, they then say that all of you as Kenyan adults are not allowed to see this. Uh, and that raises questions about who are these people and why are they morally superior to us? How are they able to watch these things and not be corrupted? Uh, and what is the view that the state has of Kenyan adults 
if they are protecting them from seeing things, almost like children? Um, and why does there exist a body paid by the state to check what Kenyan adults are looking at? It's a very strange uh, idea of the Kenyan adult as someone who needs protection from the real world, protection from ideas, protection from stories. And it just goes to show you the kind of power that storytelling has. Uh, films and stage plays were included in that act because stage plays are just as bad. Stage plays can change minds. Stage plays can make you angry. But if you go to Phoenix Players, if you go to the French Cultural Center, what do you find? You find comedy. You find Kikuyu comedy, Luo comedy, vernacular comedy. You find uh, English plays by Shakespeare. Like, no one's going to get annoyed by Shakespeare. You'll get bored, maybe, but angry, no. Uh, it's not going to teach you anything about being Kenyan because everyone on stage is talking in a British accent. You're going to watch comedies and you laugh and you go home and actually that's cool because then you're not angry. But the minute that the theater community starts to create original stories about being Kenyan, about Kenyans, there'll be a problem. And Ezekiel will go after them, I can promise you. Um, and so this, for me, this is just... It just serves to show the power of this storytelling thing. And I don't know how this stuff applies to you. I know that every human being has the capacity to tell stories. Uh, when, you, when you talk to a friend, whatever, you're telling them stories. For some of us, uh, our day job is putting those stories to words, putting those stories to images. Um, and, and I guess that's where it gets problematic. Um, I, I, I wanted to talk about um, the intersections between art and tech because I felt like you know that I had like where else would one talk about this stuff? Um, uh, a couple of years ago, I was invited to to come here uh, among many other artists, the painters, the writers, all kinds of artists, and the idea was to meet tech the people from the tech industry and kind of jam together and create something together. And a curious thing happened where, so we arrived and I remember, because the artists kind of know one another from you know, knowing one another, so there was a kind of a huddle happening in one corner. And then the techs, well, they know one another also, so there was another huddle happening on the other end of the room. And a few brave people were kind of mingling in the center because maybe they know one another or whatever. Um, and it was almost like like a speed dating <laughs> scene where like the women are on one side and the men are on another side and everyone's kind of, we don't know what to do. Um, and so we were grouped into like little groups, like uh, one tech and one creative, one tech and one creative, and to kind of come up with ideas, you know, that merge the two. And that was uh, also quite a strange experience because I felt like, I felt like I had hepatitis, and the doctor was kind of asking me about my symptoms. So, <laughs> so the so the tech guy asks me, uh, "So, what problems do you?" <laughs> uh, and so I was looking around the room, and I was seeing all these creatives kind of telling the doctors about their problems, and the techs were kind of scribbling notes down. Uh, and then the techs huddled and kind of came back to us and said, "So." We're thinking we can create a website, an app, a thing. And she was like, OK, like, <laughs> if you want to create an app, that's fine. Uh, so there's all these ideas that came up out of those huddles. Um, but nothing came of, nothing came of, the, of the thing. No websites were made, no apps were made. Uh, and I never heard from those creatives, those texts ever again. And for me, that was symptomatic of the way that we, we kind of uh, approach one another with care. Um, and it's a care that's based on what we are, not who we are. So I was being approached as an artist, capital A, not as Jim, a person, a Kenyan, like a guy who lives here. Um, and, and I suppose it's very difficult to connect with a human being if you see them as a a thing, a structure, a, doc a problem, a patient, a starving child, uh, you know, all these things that 
you could, I mean, you could drag a group of people into the iHub every week and say, so this week we have diabetes sufferers. Let's create an app for them. Let's create a thing for them. Then the next week we say, let's bring disabled people. And you just kind of wheel them into the room and let's say, let's make some tech solutions for them. And I d <laughs> I'm not sure that that's the way that things are created. I don't think Snapchat was made because a bunch of millennials were wheeled into the guys who made Snapchat and told them, you know, these are millennials. They have issues and problems. Let's create a solution. And then, bam, Snapchat. I don't think uh, SoundCloud was made by wheeling a bunch of musicians into a room and having a tech guy ask them, so what's your problem? How can we solve it? Uh, I've always felt like, like these tech things happen because someone made something that he thought would be cool. Uh, I've always felt like Snapchat was made by someone who felt, you know what, it would be cool to do whatever Snapchat does. I have no idea what Snapchat does. Um, and I suppose that it's, it's, it's better to, to see one another as people and maybe then engage on a level of you're a human being, I'm a human being, and that's then we create something together. Um, if you look at the story of the one laptop per child, that story made me so happy because when it turned out that the kids were watching porn on the free laptops. <laughs> and that's because you, you give a 12-year-old African. Yes, he's an African, a starving African with no access to technology, blah, 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 all these stories. But then he's also a 12-year-old boy whose body is awash with hormones, flooding with hormones. And so you give him a computer and access to internet, and he does what any 12-year-old would do. He looks for porn. Um, and that's that inability to see the starving African child in need of technology as a human boy. Uh, and I see these things happening over and over again. Um, I keep hearing about an app that is designed to, m to allow group X to meet group Y. Uh, and that kind of ignores the idea that at this moment, in 2016, every individual human being is way more empowered technologically than they ever have been. If I want to sing, I just record myself on a phone and put it out on YouTube, and anyone in the world can watch it. Why would I need someone to kind of step in between with a website that says, hey, this guy sings, this guy needs a singer, put them together? Not really. I don't need the middleman. Um, at this point, I. I might not even need a website, so when you tell me that you have this service that creates website for artists, I, I don't need the website. I have Facebook and I connect with thousands of people there, so what's the website for? Who visits websites these days anyway? Um, other than uh, looking for money, looking for a job, looking to get laid, those are the things that will take someone out of Facebook to some special website where you get your niche needs. If someone says there's a job that you can apply for on this website, I will go to that website. I'm a Kenyan, I need to pay rent, I will go. But a website where I get to meet person X who's on Facebook anyway, why would I leave Facebook? So I, I keep hearing these intermediate kind of apps and websites and things that come in between people, and I'm like, you don't need that shit. You have Facebook, you have Twitter, people are connecting on their own. People are broadcasting on their own. The other group of things I keep hearing is uh, this is the Kenyan Amazon, this is the Kenyan Facebook, this is the Kenyan YouTube. I don't want a Kenyan YouTube. Like, that struggle. Like, there is YouTube. I'll just go there instead. I don't need another social media. I don't need a Kenyan Facebook. Go and do what? Like, what will I find on your Kenyan Facebook that isn't on Facebook? Then you have the other group who come and say, we are designing a car for Africa. And those are a special group of people who will say, so we are designing this low-cost, rugged thing for Africa. Because, but Africans want BMWs. They don't want your low-cost thing. Like, can you imagine buying a low-cost vehicle and taking it home? Like, <laughs> like your friends would be like, is this, yo, like, is this, I can't shoot a music video with your low-cost thing. Vehicle. I don't want your low-cost vehicle. I don't want your low-cost fabrics. I, like, 
And this is that thing where human Africans are human beings and they have the same aspirations. Uh, and I find that odd. Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, people coming to do things for Africa. And it's always a reduced version of something that already exists. It's always a lighter version or a rugged version. And people don't want that shit. So I suppose that the only reason that art and tech need to come together is because magical things happen when art and tech come together. VR, yeah, you can create a headset and stick it on people, but you need the things that people see, right? Uh, someone has to make that content, and art and tech has to come together to make that happen. Uh, Star Wars inspires science. Science inspires Star Wars. It's a conversation, and magical things happen in between there. Uh, that conversation isn't happening in Kenya because artists are special people who have dreadlocks and bangles and they wear colorful things. And tech people are serious uh, people who like Star Wars uh, and code things. We'll never meet because we see one another as things, structures. Um, but I think it's important for not only for the tech to see people as people and to develop things for people, not for problems. Uh, and it's also important for the arts to open up to the idea that there can be newer ways to do things, there can be more efficient ways to do things, and then maybe that conversation can create some magic in there. I think that's all I have to say about <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a seat. Let's get you a seat here. So art and tech, where they meet, uh, seeing people as humans and not things, not byproducts, but actual tangible things that you should get to know. Telling authentic stories um, are all, I think, takeaways, right, from, from what uh, Mr. Jim has said. So now we're going to go into our question and answer series um, and conversation, really, just having a, a plain conversation. And I, I kind of, if you don't mind, if you'll allow me, I just wanted to start the conversation. What happens when the story is told, like you, you mentioned that stories are told um, about America and, and things that happen in, from an American perspective, and not necessarily from a, uh, a Kenya perspective, and so like Black Hawk Down, you mentioned when people do, when uh, Black Hawk Down came out, people signed up for the army and the military. But what happens, as we just saw last year, we have a story about Egypt, where Egypt is in Africa, but all of the protagonists are all white. What happens then? How do you deal with a story, and how do you deal with an authentic story when that happens? And so, yes, please. Um, this, white people, <laughs> <laughs> with apologies to white people in the room. Um, the other day I heard that Angelina Jolie was going to do a film about Wangari Mazai, who's like a local hero. Uh, and Kenyans were very angry about that. They said, you know, leave us alone. This is our person, blah, blah, blah. And then the backlash was, but where is your film about Wangari? It's like, she's your person, but where is your film? Like, she died two or three or four years ago. What are you waiting for? So every time, everywhere there's a vacuum, you'll find a white person, I feel. It's like sometimes, like you could go to... you. <laughs> You could go to the most remote part of this world and you find a white person doing research on like something there. Um, and, and I guess this is a byproduct of that thing of like when you grow up in a country that tells you that you are the great, you, you're a citizen of the greatest country in the world, then obviously when you step out into the world, you're bringing all the goodness and democracy and light and wonderfulness of your country to these people who don't have it. So on some level, I get it. Like it's, it's a product of the American story. <laughs> uh, but every time you find a gap somewhere, 
a story that hasn't been told, uh, a position that hasn't been filled, a career that hasn't been taken over, then you find that you, you just end up taking that thing. Um, I guess maybe the world is, is changing and that we are demanding a, a more conscious approach to the world from Americans and from the global north generally, where it's not okay to just go into every uninhabited corner of the world. It's not okay to go to every tribe that hasn't seen you yet. It's like, you don't have to. Like, <laughs> there are problems in America as well. There are stories in America that aren't being told. Uh, aren't being told incorrectly, like yeah. revisionary, yeah. right? A, a revisionist of history. Yeah. So I just want to open up the floor to any other comments, questions that we can have around authentic storytelling and what that means and understanding people for people, no matter who they are, and, and, and open up to choice. Yes. Thank you very much, Jim, for um, coming to the IHUB. Uh, it's really great to have you here. Um, my comment is around um, sort of this intersection of art and technology and what more needs to be done in order to make that a little bit more. Um, it, it can't happen after one workshop. It can't happen after one speed dating thing. Um, so a few years ago, I wrote this post about um, techies needing art um, because um, it, the techies who are here, uh, particularly the ones who code, um, there's a famous, well, not really famous, but there's a tagline for WordPress that says, code is poetry. So there, there is, um, there's an art to, to doing uh, technology. And the, the intersection between art and technology is where the most interesting things happen, I think. So I just wanted to thank you for making that point, And I wanted to underscore that to my fellow techies that um, take a moment, get to know the artists, visit artist spaces, uh, go to the Nets Collective, Corner Trust, w wherever, and get to really take in art. Because for me, it has, it has helped me uh, to think of things differently and has really enriched the way I think about technology. Um, my question for you is, um, sort of as people who, uh, there's the iHub community and then there's the Nest, uh, Nest Collective community. So there's flow in these different spaces of different types of people. Um, in order to bring people together from the art and the tech world, uh, what other constructs should we be exploring apart from this, like the speed dating thing doesn't work. What could possibly work? I suppose that on some level that the art spaces are designed to be open because art is very much about bouncing it on the people. And so I can't think of any art space that is a closed space um, because the, it, would, it would die. Uh, tech spaces, on the other hand, <laughs> are not exactly a place that like random people would walk into. Um, you'd have to have a reason to walk into a tech space. I'm, I'm not, I don't think that, uh, that those connections are curate, should be programmed or curated. Um, I feel like if you listen to the story of any tech thing, it wasn't really generated as a result of a curated meeting between people. I always feel like friends come up with this stuff. I always feel like people meet in some random conference or something, and they strike a chord. Uh, th there's something very organic about the way these things happen. I don't know how Ushahidi started. <laughs> so I honestly have no idea how, how, how to generate those sparks in a way that isn't organic. Um, I always feel like when you kind of put people together and say, you guys, I need you guys to meet. Like, you guys should spark together. It, it generally doesn't work. Uh, so what do I say? I don't know. Maybe tech people kind of go out for more things, get drunk with artists, uh, get an artist girlfriend. I don't know. Just, <laughs> just don't curate it too much. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 
Okay. Um, thanks a lot for coming. I'm a really big fan of your work, so thank you for, for talking. So my, I'm, I'm really uh, passionate about everything to do with storytelling, and I completely agree on the, the power of storytelling. Is it, does it work? Yeah. Um, but so storytelling can be a positive thing, but it can also be a negative thing, because it can have a very strong impact on people's memory and psychology, because they remember things much better. So how is it that you can, for example, if you have a story that's been told all your life, uh, let's say in Uganda, that you owe that amount of money, um, how is it that you can actually use storytelling to, because sometimes it's more, it's harder to convince somebody that they've been told a lie than to actually convince them that, like, convince them with a lie, in a sense. So how could you use storytelling to convince people that the original story that they've been told isn't real, like, that that's actually not a true story? That's true. I, I can imagine that telling people that uh, Kenya didn't win its independence in the kind of story that we've always been told would be a hard story to tell. But I feel like there, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm being optimistic, but I feel like the world is at a place where everything is up for recontextualization um, at the moment. I feel like everything is up in the air and open for questioning. Um, Bill Cosby is now not a good guy. Um, O.J. Simpson maybe was kind of a good guy, or maybe not. Um, Oscars, the Oscars, can't continue to be so white. All these things that have been taken as a given are suddenly in question, and I feel like it's a thing that's happening with the world right now. I guess, I don't know how that applies to Kenya, because Kenya, and this is something that people say about Kenya's third official language being silence. We have English, Swahili, and silence. Um, and Kenyans are very fluent in silence. Um, it's not like Shang that has flavors that kind of uh, label you as being from this part of town. Uh, silence, everyone in Kenya is very good at this stuff. If Kenyans don't like a thing, they don't say it. But you can tell by the silence that they don't like a thing. If they like a thing, they're all over it. If they, if they want to fight with you, they'll come and fight with you loudly. But silence is, I feel, is very dangerous because in there there's a, there's a shadow. You don't know how many people, you don't know what they think. Uh, you don't, and this happened with the Constitution where the church had said everyone vote no. And, and they felt like Kenyans were with it. But there was a silence. And then people went and just voted yes. And no one has been able to account for that silence, because like the chat, like it worked. Like every Sunday, they were telling people, "Don't do it." And you know how many people go to church in Kenya. Uh, and for me, that was very interesting that all these people were going to church and being told, "You can't vote yes on this constitution," and then they were just not listening. They were just silence about their, about their, their yes. Um, so, it is. This kind of uh, opening, this kind of place where the world is, where everything is up for investigation. I don't know if it really applies to Kenya because we never have, even if you look at uh, our cultural scene, we don't have a uh, we don't have a culture of responding to things. Uh, when someone writes, when someone puts up some stupid like Nairobi Diaries, like if you hate Nairobi Diaries. The conversation around Nairobi Diaries has not happened in public. It happens in like on your wall in Facebook. It happens on WhatsApp, but there isn't like a response publicly. Um, and so, on some level, there's a big gap in terms of knowing what Kenyans really think about things. The other thing that happens with Kenyans is the 844 thing, where you can go out and do a, a an opinion poll with Kenyans and ask them do you think that tribalism is a bad thing? And they'll say, yes, tribalism needs to end. We are one. Like you heard those things. You've seen all these campaigns that say Kenyans, we are one. There's no such thing as tribe. They happen every year. They happen a lot during elections. But then we still go and fight. And I call that the 844 thing, where you, you know the right answer. You know what the person asking you needs to hear. And so you'll say it. You'll say tribe is a cultural thing. 
tribe, I'm proud of my tribe, but I don't think, you know, all these things that Kenyans say in public to the people who are asking, but then you go right back and buy a gun and say, this time I'm going to fuck them up, they come. <laughs> and, it's, and that's a thing that Kenyans do where you have two diametrically opposed opinions and they sit in your head and it's fine. And I suppose maybe that's the thing that we learned to do during the Moi administration where you had to be, you had to shut up and protest at the same time. You had to dislike the man, but you had to watch news about him every day and smile. Um, and so Kenya is a particularly difficult space to get honesty. Yeah. So is it possible to, to re kind of to, to rewire our history using storytelling? It is possible, but I think Kenya is a particularly difficult space to try and do that in. Yeah. Man, I rumble. Thank you. Um, thanks, Jim. I'm really uh, very interested in what you were saying about sort of the role of the state in storytelling, as well as um, the censorship that comes with it. That's not a word you use, but that's what I took from it. And um, you working in that space as well. Um, have you been able to sort of figure out how to stay two steps ahead? And if perhaps sort of movement into web perhaps web series, YouTube, is there freedom there that perhaps the state does not have access to that? I'm not sure. Um, so can you speak on that a little? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, no, the web is not safe in Kenya. They, they amended that to make sure that the, that the web is one of the places where that they consider a public space. Um, how do you stay two steps ahead of censorship? Um, I don't know. It's been very strange. Like these days when I write scripts, I think, um, what are they going to say about this? Which is the oddest thing. It's never happened to me in my life to, to consider the opinion of some other guy. So every time we send scripts to the film classification board, or to like these, like we're always like uh, sweating in the office because we're like, yo, these guys could say anything. Uh, every time we get a license to, <laughs> to shoot a film, there's cheering in the office because you never know. Um, I guess still we are able to do things the way that we wanted to do them because um, the, the, the magic of film is that scripts are rarely uh, ever representative of what the thing will actually feel and sound like. And so I put a, gr a lot of faith in the process of editing and that it's possible to still extract the meaning that you wanted using the script that you submitted. Uh, I have great faith in that process. And I think so far it's worked for us that we're able to create things the way we wanted to, but that the script somehow still pass <laughs> the state. Yeah. Hello. Um, I really like what you've been, uh, been working on. I've been following your, wa your work for a bit. Uh, I have a question that's a bit maybe further from what exactly you are in. Satire. Um, she's mentioned how people want to stay ahead of censorship. And you've mentioned how you have to send your scripts back and forth. And some people have been able, uh, with time, perhaps to go around direct contact with organizations like the government or bodies that would censor artists by claiming this is all good humor. I mean, of course, XYZ tried it and that went back and forth. That didn't go very well. What do you think, personally, is, is, is there hope for satire in the Kenyan and the African setting as a way of, of dissecting it? Will you m make jokes about someone and he'll run up to your house the following day? Um, and satire specifically on the web, um, as a content producer myself, I sometimes wonder what's going to happen, but it's just small, stupid stuff you do on, on my own. But if, if this were ever to expand, do you think um, that b the ability to shoot that poss possibly anywhere or just create your own content without having to go through the boards and, and through the governing bodies, do you think that's a, an avenue that can be lead to like, greater uh, content distribution, or must you go through the 
channels and must you t fine tune what you're currently making, even if it's just jokes, to fit the powers that be? Um, I'm going to say that uh, the act of censorship in Kenya is still a very political thing, that it has very little to do with the actual content, and it has a lot to do with the timing of your content and who you are and how visible you are. So the vast majority of content producers don't even have to get licenses uh, because they are not, you know, like if you're shooting a thing in your bedroom, like chances are that you'll never run into uh, the state. Uh, but the state collides with you as soon as you enter a public space in a way that is meaningful. Um, to screen a film in a cinema in Kenya, you have to get classification, and that's where the state comes in. Um, it's a clever way to, to do it, because then for your art to reach a bigger audience, you have to engage with the state. Um, if you look at comedy in Kenya, there's been, I, I feel like there's been a, a kind of a failure uh, from the comedy crowd, because comedy is one of the most can be the most biting social commentary you'll ever get in culture. Um, I think comedians can say things that I would never be able to say with a film. Uh, but if you look at Kenyan comedy, there's been, it has been denatured. Uh, you'll get tribal stereotypes. You'll get, like, it's, it's, it's quite, it's quite entry level comedy because if you start to to really talk about what's going on in this country and make people laugh about it, then you'll get in trouble. Um, so I invite you, look at look at Kenyan comedy, look at Churchill, look at all these guys. Um, it's like comedy has degenerated into this kind of tribal farce, like I can do accents. Every morning radio has a tribal like guy. I think everyone had like the, I had a, I had a terrible one the other day with a Somali woman. And and for you to have a Somali woman on radio every morning and not talk about what's going on with Somalis in this city, in this country, is is that denaturing I'm talking about. Um, and so, yes, satire is wonderful. I feel like the, m the most biting commentary I've ever had about any country usually comes from the comedians. And it's because they look like they're, they're just joking around. Um, and so, yes, it would be wonderful if you want to do satire that, that bites. I think if the state ever clamps down on you, then you know you're doing a good thing. If the state ignores you, then it means that either you're not really touching on anything serious or that they don't think you're a threat. Uh, so if I were you, I'd actually work to get, <laughs> to get the state all up in your face because then it means that you're doing something that, that, that they feel is threatening and is important. Yeah. Hey, Jim. How are you doing? <coughs> um, as far as the kind of content you do, um, I feel that there's a um, there's a huge market for it. Like in terms of, um, for instance. Uh, Kenyans, Ke Kenyans on uh, YouTube consume 83% um, of 83% uh, foreign content. So it means that Kenyans are indeed, you know, looking for you know your type of content. And while offline there's a problem, um, you know, maybe online, you know, maybe. Um, there's a solution online, and I like what you did with um, uh, Tuko Matro. I feel that probably that halfway house, um, maybe not cinema, maybe you know, maybe not what we're used to, um, you know. But that's like a fantastic way of getting more people to um, consume your content. It is important, um, I feel, because uh, five years ago. Um, if you went online, most text content, so we're talking about articles, you know, that kind of thing, um, most of it was ab ab about Kenya, was created by foreigners. 
um, we, I'm a blogger, we were able to change that by just simply availing the content. And, you know, and, and guys just, you know, read it. I'm not saying that the quality of content is fantastic, but there's, you know, more content now about Kenya by Kenyans and, you know, people are reading. Um, and I feel probably that um, that's the way to go. Looking for platforms, they don't necessarily have to be online. Looking for platforms, creating the content A, and then looking for platforms where people can consume um, the content. It could be something as simple as house parties, just availing the content and then, you know, um, getting people to, you know, um, to, to sh showcase them at a house party. Um, there's, a, there's another thing that people say within the, the content industry in Kenya, whether it's advertising or film or all these things, is that Kenyans are dumb and that you have to dumb down your story so that Kenyans can relate to it. That's a thing I've heard over and over again. Ever since I used to work in advertising, even now, as, late, as recently as last month, you hear this thing where people say that you can't, you can't create a story that's too complex because Kenyans won't get it, and so you dumb down, dumb down, dumb down. And this is a conversation that's happening in mainstream media. Um, and so no wonder people are watching 80, 70, 80% foreign content because the local content is dumbed down. Um, and there's, there's a weird tangent where people say Kenyans are not patriotic, that we're not supporting Kenyan content. But if your content is dumbed down, why do you want people to support it? Um, so there has to, the, the, there's a shift that needs to happen in terms of people trusting that Kenyan audience, because Kenyan audiences watch everything. They watch CSI, they watch Scandal, they watch Game of Thrones. So what, what, what wouldn't they get about your content? What's so complex about your content that a Game of Thrones viewer wouldn't get it? Um, no spoiler alerts, please. Yes. Um, film is a language. Um, the language of film is something that people, that the global, like anyone who's on, like most people in Nairobi, most people in Kenya, get what a flashback is. They understand, you know, like, uh, and so I feel like there's something very condescending about that idea. Uh, two, with Tukomacha, we decided to go online. And there was a lot of thought about why we shouldn't go online. People say Kenyans, Kenyans don't have bundles. Kenyans are not going to watch anything that's more than five minutes because like, content on Facebook is like two minutes, five minutes. It's little things. And here you are with your 15-minute episode. Uh, Kenyans are not going to watch that shit. Um, but the reality is that in Kenya, we have what? Four cinema screens? You know? So feature film doesn't make sense, honestly. I feel like filmmakers in Kenya shouldn't bother making feature films that go to cinema because you'll get 3,000 people if you're lucky. If you work really hard and you spend millions on mainstream advertising, you'll get 3,000 people. Like, that doesn't make sense. Like, when there's 2 million people watching Saudi Soul's video, like, that's where you should be working. So our, our ideas about what form our stories should take and how long they should be, God, why would anyone want to sit through your two-hour thing in a cinema and pay 300 bob and be asked to buy <laughs> popcorn and expensive hot dogs when they can just kind of use that 200 bob for a bundle and watch your thing online? I think we have to change the way we look at form and content. And then maybe, yeah, things have to change. Hello. Um, I'm a little bit interested in you as a filmmaker with relation to the silence that you talked about. So um, I, I don't know. I'm quite interested in what the push is because I have found artists I have met a lot of artists who look at the news, who watch the news and see everything that is going on. And they recognize what's going on and the need to redefine who they are through stories. But then they somehow end up choosing not 
to tell those stories. And then I remember hearing about stories of our lives when you made it. And I was like, yeah, I would really like to meet this guy because I would like to see someone who says, yeah, I know you don't want to talk about the gay people. You just want to shut your eyes and assume that because you're not gay, there's no one who is. And no one really, uh, and this perception that it's evil and everyone having all these awkward perceptions and you decided that, yeah, I know you're going to squirm and probably not allow me to show it, but screw you, I'm going to do what I want to do. So I want to, I'm a little bit interested in where that point comes where you're like, I know this is not the conventional way of going, but I'll go to it anyway. I'm a little bit interested in that bit. Okay, wow. Um, like I said earlier on, uh, my relationship with storytelling has changed over the years. Um, there were times when I was able to tell a story that I was not relating to at all. It was just that it was a cool thing, and then you just do a story. Um, but then when you start to see storytelling as a thing that is important to do, not just because you want to be, you know, I mean, to get an award or whatever, but that it's almost like your duty uh, because in this country, everyone has a thing that they're good at or a thing, luckily, that they're able, that they're able to do well. And there's a sense that that thing that you're good at doing is the reason you are on this planet, whether you believe in God or whatever. But here you are, and you're this person who's able to make films or write books or make programs. Or, and, and so who else is going to do it? Um, if these stories are not being told, who else is going to tell them? And here you are with your, with your skill, with your ability to make this thing. Now, the, the transition that happened for me was that I realized that it's not supposed to be easy, that you're supposed to shit your pants, uh, you're supposed to be scared, you're supposed to be worried what your parents will think, you're supposed to be worried what your friends will think. Uh, like filmmaking isn't supposed to be like this joyride where you just jump from one award show to another. That is also the, the scary stuff where you are honestly very worried what people will think. Uh, so I'm not gonna pretend like I was like, yo, whatever. I know you guys don't like this, but I'm going to do it. But anyway, it was not. It was terrible. I remember I was not sleeping. And it was all of us as a collective, because it was a, it was a journey for all of us. Um, we wondered what people would think about the nest as an institution. We wondered, you know, like everything had to be negotiated. Who are your friends? Who are not your friends? And, and that is when we really discovered silence uh, as a language, because no one ever came and told us. I really hate that you did this thing. No one ever told us that. There was just silence. Uh, friends who used to talk to you suddenly don't talk to you anymore, but they won't tell you why. And you, you can't ask why. I mean, you can't go up to a person and tell them, I feel like you're not talking to me anymore. <laughs> so, so yes, there are some stories that are difficult to tell, not only because they are there are things that are people are not going to be receptive to, but also because the process on your body and on your heart and on your friends and on your family is also going to be difficult. And that's where the no comes in. The difference between your friends saying, I, I, I know this needs to be told, and why don't they tell it, is because they know that in between those two steps, there's your friends, there's your family, there's your money, all these things that we negotiate to become human beings in this city. Yeah, they're all, you have to test them all to do some of these things. Would you do it again? Uh, I think once you do it, it gets easier. I still get scared. Like, even with Tukumacho and it was going out, I was like, Kenyans are going to hate this shit. And they're going to just say, like, yo, what, what are you doing? So I think every time I put stuff out, I'm always afraid. Uh, I'm always afraid that, that this one will not be understood, that this one, you know, it's, it's always frightening. Uh, so I think it gets easier after a while. Yeah. So the artists that are in the audience, do you feel the same way? That you kind of, you know, take what's in your heart and your head and you explore it on paper and you make poetry, but then you're afraid to give it to the world. 
And that's kind of what I'm hearing, right? Is like that there's this struggle where you want to tell this really incredible story that you think needs to be told, but then the, the action of actually giving it to the world can be kind of tough. So there seems to be a lot of artists in the, in the room. Is that a struggle for anyone? Yay, is silence the language here? No? OK. <laughs> Please. Speaking to the mic. Speaking to the mic. So first of all, are you an artist? Are you I a consider techie? myself an artist. You consider <laughs> yourself an artist. Yes. So are you scared when you put your heart and your soul into a piece of art and then you mm. have to deliver it to the world? Is that a scary process for you? Can I, can I answer it in form of my question? Yeah. yeah okay. So um, when you introduced him, you said, this is Jim Chuchu. He's done a series, blah, blah, blah. It has 50,000 views on YouTube. You know, we clapped. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I remember I, I listened to anything and everything. There's a part Jay-Z in one of his songs, Moment of Clarity, he says, if lyrics, uh, if lyrics sold, truth be told, I'd lyrically be Talib Kweli. Uh, if he were to sell, if he were to go for commercial, for impact, he'd, he would, he would, oh, sorry, sorry, it's the other way around. If he were to choose to explore himself as an artist, he'd probably be rhyming deeper, he'd be doing deeper stuff than what he is doing then. So now, as an artist, uh, there is that 50,000 views that you want at the end of the day. And at the, same di at the same time, there's you as an artist. And there's parts of you that you feel that are not, as, in, uh, as a writer, I used to write and get to points where I look at what I've written and you're looking at it and you're like, hey, does this make sense? Yes. Am I crazy? There's this idea. Like there's one point where we explained why z zero is God. You know, how do you connect the two and you know actually make it make sense? So anyway, the point is, as an artist, do you aim for impact? You know, which gives you purpose, which gives you like you know you're doing shit, or do you actually sit back and explore yourself as an artist to points where you know you have explored and you have nothing else to to give out? You know. You explore yourself to the limit, or do you go for impact where everybody understands you? And you know, and this is common, especially now that the world is getting together because of tech. We tend to think alike. We tend to, you know, laugh alike. You know, like the Twitter emoji for the smiley face with crying tears. It was shared 12 billion times. You know, everybody laughs the same. You know, we all do things the same way. We dance the same way. The dab, the blah blah blah. You know, so as an artist, do you? get out of the park, go into your, find your own world, or do you aim for impact? And where is the thin line between the two? Money or art? Question, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, money or art is how I usually just collapse all those uh, thoughts. Um, uh, because uh, people have to pay rent in this city, uh, because you have to eat, um, money will never go away as a conversation. Um, and so I'm, I'm not the guy who will say um, you should be true to yourself and like make art that makes you happy, because then who's going to pay your rent? Um, and it's also not for me to say that, um, you know, look for impact, look for audiences, and like whatever they want, do it. Um, I always feel like that's a very individual choice, um, and everyone has to choose for themselves. Th I don't think there's a right way to do it, because um, to be popular and to be, you know, to have all this, like, to have the money and all this stuff that comes with being a certain kind of artist who doesn't, um, who does the thing that Jay-Z has said he does. Um, it's a choice, it has a price, and it has good things and has bad things. The good things that, I mean, you can then be a billionaire, and then every th all these other problems kind of go away. But there's something you lose in the process, um, which is why he'd then make this song and refer to that, because it's something that he knows. 
On the other hand, if you choose to be true to yourself and to die for your art, which means that you'll be broke and whatever, and these are the extremes I'm talking about, because they're they are, they are middle grounds in all this stuff, then, and I meet artists like that all the time who say, I quit my job in advertising, I am like I'm going to follow through on my art, but then I don't have money and I need your help. And that's also not a good place to be. Um, I, let me speak for myself, I uh, made a choice earlier on that, that, that I hate client work. I've never met a good client in my life. I've never met a client who, who I enjoy working with. Uh, and clients, uh, some, are, some are pretty bad even from the beginning. Like they don't hide the fact that they don't respect you and that they think, you know, like if you've worked with clients, you know those clients who come in with, with the devil on their back. But then there are other clients who come and say, no, this one is different. Like this project is really cool. Like I'll let you, like you have free reign, you'll be able to do whatever you want. We really like your style. Like you know those ones who come with like flowers and, and wonderfulness. And then you say, yes, a wonderful client. Yes, I'm going to do it. And then somewhere in between, things change. And they say, we really like your style, but could you, like this logo needs to move there. You need to change the color here. Like all those things. And then they are just like every other client. So I chose. I chose not to to do that, and it was tough. There were many years of of uh, being broke, and I remember we used to live in the together as the band, and I think our rent was like eight thousand at first, and then it went to twelve. Like it was like a struggle, and I remember we used to have many meetings at some point where there's a day where we had an avocado and like a half cucumber in the fridge, and. <laughs> And my friend Jockey had to bring for us food. Like there were those days when we really used to wonder, what are we doing? Like, like our friends who quit this art life and went and became advertising executives or whatever, they had money, they were buying cars, and here we were jabbing and like it's terrible. Um, and that, honestly, if you're gonna choose to be truthful with your work, you're gonna have to pass through those days. There'll be day, even now there are times when I look at my work and I'm like. But my friends, they own their houses. I'm paying rent. My friends have these huge cars, like, and I don't. And that thing never goes away. So if you decide to go that way, it's going to be a fight. Uh, but there are moments of, of, of real joy when you create a thing that's, that's very close to the thing that you wanted to make. And I suppose that's the payoff. It's I'm alive. <laughs> And for now, for all the years I've been working, it has, it has been OK. Every time I put out a song and I'm like, I'm really proud of this thing. Um, I, didn't, I didn't change it. I didn't shift it. I didn't. And they are, yeah, maybe like in five years, ask me this question again, and I'll be like, whatever. I don't care about the joy anymore. I want money. But for now, it works for me. Uh, you're going to have to make that choice for yourself. So I'm curious, how do you keep like your ideas, um, how do I want to put it, not polluted by Western? Because the problem I always have is I think of this like cool idea for a film, and I'm like, oh, I'm thinking of this idea of like a robot or something. Then I'm like, oh, wait, that's like Terminator or like at Star Wars or at Star Trek or any other, name any other film, you know, after watching like hundreds and hundreds of films. Um, how do you like uh, keep your ideas like to your, like, and when you come up with an idea like, oh, this is actually this is actually pretty new. It's not it's not like a rehashing of something. It's not like you've taken like many pieces and put them together. It's actually like your core idea. Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, um, original ideas. I I don't think I've ever had one. Um, and even if I thought I had one, I put something out and then, like even with the Tukomacho, everyone's come and said, oh, this is like the Kenyan arrow. It's the Kenyan person of interest. It's the Kenyan, like all these things that I've never watched. Uh, so even if I thought I had an original idea, there's something out there that kind of mirrors. Um, there's a terrible thing that happened to me a couple of years ago where I'd keep writing stories and then the thing would happen in public. And so then I couldn't put out the story because then I'd look like 
I was just riffing off the news piece. It happened about three times, and it was very frustrating. But at the same time, it made me feel like maybe there's this thing people call zeitgeist, which is that idea that human beings are all experiencing the same things. And so the ideas that come to us don't only come to one person. They come to like 15,000 people. And then it's up to you, wherever you are, to do your version of it, uh, which is why like two years ago, there were so many end of the world films I guess after years of reading about climate change, all these filmmakers had the same urge to make something that felt urgent or whatever. So I don't, original ideas, you can, I've, I've never seen one. Um, I guess there are, there are those happy accidents where you create something that's truly a new thing. And that usually comes when there's a new medium, which is why Facebook Live allows you to do a thing that's truly unique. You know, Snapchat will probably create some new things. Virtual reality will probably create a whole bunch of new things. Um, but I don't think the idea is to chase original ideas. I think it's just to do the one that you have really well and then hope that people will connect with it. How do I stay? How do I keep away from Western influence? That's difficult, yeah? Um, last year, I made a decision not to, to stop watching films. Um, because I, f I felt that thing that you're saying about like everything that we see, ev all the film language I know is American, is, is British, mostly American. You people are terrible. Um, and it happens a lot. I go to all these film workshops where students are told that to be a filmmaker, you have to watch three feature films every week and like 15 short films, and like people have numbers, and like there's a list of classic films that are a canon for every film student to watch. I watched Citizen Kane, and I was bored out of my mind. <laughs> and it, it's boring, but most people won't, 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 you know, won't say it in public, because then what kind of film student are you who doesn't like a classic? You're, um, but the net effect of that is that we are, our film language is corrupted, is influenced. And that's why you see all these Kenyan soaps that look like Sex and the City. And it's terrible, because why are we making Sex and the City in Nairobi? Um, when there is a proper sex in the city that has a bigger budget, better costumes, better makeup than you will ever have. Like, it'll never compare. Um, and so what happened to me since I stopped watching film is that now I'm not able to watch films. I can't sit for two hours and watch a film. I am, I just, I can't do it anymore. Uh, I am I'm actively avoiding American content just to see what happens to me. I'm reading a lot more comics. I've never watched Game of Thrones. Um, and people are finding that weird because they're like, what kind of filmmaker are you who doesn't watch film? But I don't think that's how things work. I think I get ideas for movies from listening to a song, from reading a book, from talking with a friend, from reading the news. Like, honestly, if you want original ideas, just read our papers. Like, the stuff people do in Kenya is, is way more original than anything you could ever come up with. Um, so yeah, it is true. I feel like it's a conversation that African cinema, African writing, African anything has to have, that we need to stop watching so much American stuff, stop reading so much American stuff, because it's, it's corrupting our language. And it makes me wonder whether, if you watch films from South Korea, they have a thing that's theirs. They have an odd way of telling stories. If you watch British TV, it's very different from American TV. Um, if you watch anime, anime is their thing. Like, no one else does anime. Um, and so I wonder what African cinema is. I don't see films and see African cinema. And it's because we are all watching the same stuff. Uh, yeah, those are my thoughts. I have one question. Um, how do you balance between film, photography, and music? And how, how do you balance between film, photography, and music? And how are you able to create good content across the board? Uh, balance. I don't balance. I have, it's terrible. I am late on everything. 
like when I make a film, then I haven't made music for a long time. Like the last time I put out a song was in September last year because I've been working on film. So for me, that it's terrible and I hate it so much because then I'm, I always feel like I'm not able to go deep into the things that I do. Uh, and it's a fight I've had for years about what should I focus on? Should I be a filmmaker? Should I be a photographer? Um, but then I made a choice to just use whatever medium comes to me. And I think I've been given space by audience to kind of jump around and they don't hold it against me. But the, 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 the problem with that is that then there's a thing that happens when you get deep into a medium that you get better and better at it. Uh, and I feel like on some level, I haven't been able to really go deep into music. I haven't been able to go really deep into film. Uh, it's worked so far. Um, but who knows, maybe I could have been much, much better at it. So I don't think I'd recommend it to anyone. And that it's a thing that Kenyans do a lot because with 844, we were taught to be good at everything. You have to be good at agriculture, science, maths, English, home science. So you jump from growing cabbages to like, to like sewing lap bags, like 844 is crazy. Uh, we are not taught to be specific, we are not taught to be intense and to go deeply into things. Other countries, like if a kid is good at sports, you throw them in there, you teach them basics, how to count, how to pay rent, but then if running is your thing, then run, 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 run. And then that's where you get Usain Bolt, you get all these people who excel far beyond. But with us, it's like, and I see it a lot. I meet a lot of artists who are like, yeah, I, I design clothes, but also in the evening I am a writer. And I don't think it's a good idea, but we don't talk about it enough that Kenyans need to just focus. Uh, especially if you look at uh, animation, um, the CG, 2D, 3D, where everyone has to be good at every step, whereas in other countries you're good at one thing, and then there's other people who kind of fill in. In Kenya, if you're doing 3D animation, you have to learn how to model, light, sculpt, render material, all those things. And so you're not never able to go deep into a thing. And we're going to, I don't know when that will ever shift. Maybe the kids who are in school now who are doing like five subjects will be better at it. But I, Kenya is not a country where people are taught to go deep into things. It's a pity. A practice makes a an expert, right? So going deep into something, focusing on something, ten thousand hours equates to expertise. <coughs> but it, on the up side of that, to what you were saying, even being well-rounded, even having I know you guys have been talking about this, but even being well-rounded and and really being able to kind of do a little bit of everything is also a really great gift to have. Because now you're not stuck in one world. You can really explore and take advantage of, of other worlds. You guys had a question, comment? Uh, yes. Uh, we, you know, we're just talking about the 10,000 <laughs> 10, hours uh, thing. Um, my name is Julian. I just wanted to give, mine is more of a little feedback. Because uh, as we're going along, I'm picking answers you know, in my head and you know, from what you're asking about. Uh, you know, as an artist, whether you struggle with producing content and putting it out there and you know money versus impact and all these things and uh, and then I remember there's something that I'd actually read somewhere and then I picked it up very quickly and it says uh, I don't know who wrote it but it says I disagree with the notion that creativity and suffering are inherently linked just because you're an artist doesn't mean you have to be mentally unstable uh, and I'll add <coughs> that you also don't need to you know have money to you know you don't you don't have to be associated with these things just because you're an artist um, I've met people who have over the years managed to find a balance right where you know and I would say this from a Kenyan context where you're battling with your folks telling you look if you get out of school you have to make money right you have to go into this career you have to go into the other 
uh, whatever, whatever it is that you end up doing, you have to make money at the end of the day. So it's sort of a struggle as an artist to, I mean, for me, I would say, for example, because uh, I've, I've delved into photography and I'm a photographer, where, you know, you go to the commercial side and you're pulled to that side and you try to bring in your creativity. Uh, but then if you want to shoot some street and do a, an exhibition and show some people some pictures and tell some kind of a story, then you don't necessarily make any money because it's not like the National Museum is going to start commissioning you to immediately, rather. So you want to do that, but at the same time, I also want to participate in, uh, in my family life, right? <coughs> you know, I want to be part of what my family is doing and their investments, their gatherings, and you also want to look like you're a successful person, but you also want to participate in society. That's what I'm saying. I mean, the struggle is not necessarily even tied to family, but you also want to participate in society and not be selfish. So the idea, I mean, it might not be there at the beginning, but I think as you grow, as you grow into your industry, as you grow into practicing and just networking, meeting other people and meeting, uh, you know, I, I've, I've had uh, one or two mentors and they've gone through the same, the same process. And you see someone is, you know, almost turning 40 and they drop everything, like seriously, everything. And they sell everything and they get into a different uh, state of mind and they say, look, I'm going to change this uh, and I'm going to do this a little bit differently. And I uh, also draw a little bit of inspiration from my aunt who was a painter in the 80s, right? And the whole family, the whole family rejected her, right? Like she went crazy. She literally lost her shit. And, uh, <laughs> and so people were accepting her much later now in the, in the you know, when I'm, when I'm past high school and I'm almost into uni, this is when the rest of the family, even nearing when uh, now my grandfather, her father was dying, that she now is accepted and people are now talking to her and whether she's able to have those conversations. So it will, it will drive you crazy at some point. Uh, it should, and one of my mentors says that it has to disturb you uh, for you to be able to do it. That if, if you truly it is an art, then you really have to get uncomfortable because otherwise if you're comfortable, you're not going to be able to produce anything. It has to actually get close to driving you mad <laughs> so that you can get that sort of push, especially if you're a Kenyan where you have been beaten down and be told you have to do things uh, in a certain way. Thank you. My name is George. I am a big fan of Jim <laughs> and his work. I've known him for a bit. Um, I just wanted to comment on the place that Kenyans like to go a lot. Uh, I don't know whether it's informed by religion or informed by uh, sort of a deep desire to please our parents. Uh, that place of balance that place of being good. Um, and in a country that is predominantly poor, uh, a lot of people are either immediately from poor or immediately from being very rich. And those are the few. Um, I don't know what balance looks like, whether there's something like that ever. The country is not balanced, the education is not balanced, a diet is not balanced. Uh, so speak a little bit about this desire at your 20s and your early 30s to achieve a palliative band-aid or painkiller called self-help. 10 steps to <laughs> everyone should find a mentor. Uh, I, I've been given many mentors over time and no one has ever transformed my condition. Uh, so then, yeah, just speak to that because I also feel that there's a thing that Kenyans do to themselves to just keep sane or to ignore the context. I don't know. Maybe it works in other countries. I don't know. Um, I ha that idea of like to be an artist, you have to be suffering. Yes, it's, it's such a myth. Uh, but there are people who believe it strongly. So I know people who jump from one toxic relationship to another so they can stay inspired. 
writers are very famous for this, where they go looking for trauma, so then they can have something to write about. Um, it hap I, I swear to God, it happens a lot. Um, and that's why sometimes I wonder about this idea that to be an artist, you have to be found at a bar every night. Uh, you have to be fighting with your spouse, uh, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, because then you're alive and you're on the edge of life and you're just struggling. Um, I don't think that's true. I feel like there are artists who have been very stable and very boring, and they're still able to create things. Uh, once you decouple the idea that to be an artist, you have to be, you have to look a certain way, you have to have a certain hairstyle, you have to have a certain lifestyle. I, I don't believe in that stuff. Um, they desire to be good. My parents hate my work. They, they hate my clothes. They, my parents don't, don't even know what I do. They've never seen my films. They not listen to my music. Uh, so that, that thing of being good, I, I let go of it a long time ago. Um, in their eyes, it would be much better if I found a stable job, stopped wearing jeans, uh, got married, had three kids. Like that's, that's my parents' desire for my life. Uh, and, and that fight doesn't stop. It, it goes on and on. I've been fighting about this since I was 14, 15, 18. It doesn't change. Uh, even in my 30s, I still go home and I'll be asked, oh God, this, <laughs> this damn film stuff. This and the other day when I was telling them that I'm working on a new series, the only question I was asked was, what is the subject? Is it good or bad? And, and I felt like the idea there was, that they have become a kind of censorship board of their own, um, in the sense that they don't want me to do any crazy stuff. And if I'm doing crazy stuff, they want to discourage me from doing it, because then it, it plays out badly on them also. And so I understand that idea about not being selfish, because the things that I do as an artist do play out on my family, because there'll be those relatives who go and say, hey, your son, you know. Uh, but balance sometimes is a dangerous thing because uh, it makes you cut out all your extremes. Um, and there's nothing that's balanced about being human. There's nothing that's balanced about love and laughter and, and all those things. Uh, happiness is not a thing that, uh, that comes and stays, even though most people work towards a state of happiness. It doesn't happen. Um, even when you get that billion, like Jay-Z, you still go and cheat on your wife, who's like this am amazing, beautiful woman, but then you're, you're cheating on her because it's never enough. It'll never be enough. Um, so balance is such a myth. Um, in balance, there is self-censorship. In balance, there is uh, a numbing of yourself because then it means that you'll make songs about being happy. And then when you're not happy, you, you don't make songs. Or you make fake songs about being happy. I've met, I've met artists who are, who are dark people. You know, there, there's some people who are just dark, you know? Like, they, they're not necessarily like happy people. But then if you listen to their music, it's just sunflowers and sparkly glitter. And, and the audience doesn't really get into it because they feel like there's something, yeah, Adele, doesn't make happy music. Like people cry buckets listening to Adele albums, but that hasn't stopped her from being successful. But in Kenya, we have this thing where, why are you making a film about terrorism? Why can't you make a film about a young girl who's trying to find love in the city? Damn it! Like, wh what's all this? What's all this terrorism stuff? Uh, why are you taking photographs of the city at night? This is a city at day. You can do nice photographs of the buildings with like color and light. I remember when we showed the first episode of Tukomacho to a group of the first audience, one of the questions we got was, it's so dark. Like, are you going to show us uh, footage of the city greenery and the lights and the... <laughs> and, and we're like, uh, no. <laughs> because like, what does the greenery have to do with anything? Um, I think we are afraid of dark stuff as a city because if there's ever if there's a dark city in this world it is Nairobi literally and I mean that literally there are parts of the city that have no light 
So when you ask me to make up, uh, why are you asking why is it so dark? Is it, it's because it's happening in a dark place. And the fact that for you, and this is that thing that we do when we go home, for those who have power, because not everyone in this city has electricity, the first thing you do when you go home tonight, you switch on the lights, because that's that action of switching on the light turns this dark place into your home. It removes all the shadows. It means that if there's anyone hiding in the bedroom, you'll see them. And so that action of turning on the light is both security, it's ownership, it's making this space warm, it's making this space yours. Um, so if you shoot something in the dark, people are like, I want to see. I don't, want, I don't like the fact that I can't see the person who's talking. Because in this city, not knowing who's behind you, not knowing what's happening around the corner is a very dangerous thing to happen. And so I feel like because we don't have that language where we talk to one another and say, this is what's happening, this is why dark images frighten you, we then say, will you have greenery? Because it's, you're not able to, you don't have the words to explain why you don't like this dark imagery. Um, Nairobi is not light. It doesn't have light everywhere. And that's something that we, as people who make content or take in this content, we have to start to look at the parts of the city that are dark, not just literally in terms of not having light, even though those exist, but they are those dark spaces because dark things happened there and no one ever went and shone a light there to say, we are sorry, or that we see you, or we recognize what happened here. And so there are dark spaces metaphorically in this city that no one ever goes into. And storytelling means we have to go there even when we are scared. So what about mentorship? How important is mentorship? I've never had a mentor in my life. Uh, I figured out everything I know myself and with the internet and just figuring stuff out because um, who was going to mentor me? I mean, I. Maybe and maybe it's a personality thing. Maybe there, are, maybe there are people who thrive off of uh, apprenticeship and receiving instructions from people who know better. But I've never been that person, and also I've never looked for people like that around me. Um, would you recommend mentorship, and would you offer yourself up as a mentor? I'm kind of a reluctant mentor because, like, I have people around me who I think I cause more damage to than, <laughs> than like, because um, what does anyone know? Like, like, and I give Jay-Z as an example again. What, what can Jay-Z mentor you about if he's not able to look at Beyonce and say, you know what, I'm not going to cheat on you? Like, what, what, what can he teach you? Because even when he's successful, it's not enough. He's just like you. Um, so I've always been distrustful of this idea of, of putting a person in a place of where they are, where they know more. Uh, technically, I guess it works. Like if someone knows how to use a program better than you, then I guess it works. But this idea that, they, that you can mirror your life with a person, I don't think it's a, it's a safe idea. Yeah. OK, so we're going to close out. Any final words, comments, thoughts? Um, I'll just say thank you. I always say thank you at the end of these things because um, for you to sit there and like listen to me going on and on is, is not something I take for granted. Uh, so thank you for sitting through this. And, and I hope that things like these, uh, because I learn a lot from things like these where like, I hear thoughts from people that push me a little. Um, I hope that they are useful to the people on the other end because then I've, like, I've been in situations like this many times where we sit and say, oh, from today we are going to change this city, we are going to, and then it doesn't really happen because, because it's hard. Uh, but anyway, thank you for sitting through this. Thank you so much for joining us. Give them a round of applause. Thank you.